Thank you for that, that, that very powerful presentation, Dr. Dorsey. So we are now going to begin our live Q&A session. Before we do, I just want to go over a few things so everybody knows how it works. We don't take questions directly from the chat room. What you need to do is virtually raise your hand. If you're not sure how to do this, what you need to do is go to the bottom of the Zoom window. Second from the right, you'll see a button that says reactions. You'll click on that and then click on raise hand in the pop-up menu. When I call your name, I will unmute you and prompt you to state where you're from and, and to ask your question. We ask that everyone keep their questions brief and on topic. So with all of that said, we have a question from Deborah, who I think goes by Debbie, if I'm correct. Please state where you're from and ask your question. Hi, yeah, it is Debbie. Uh, I'm from Massachusetts. And um, what I want to ask you is, I understand that we have to like avoid these chemicals and um, air pollution. And I, and I heard you as, you know, wash your vegetables um, and fruit and, and things like that. What I want to know, is there, is there a more active, um, I, I want to say pre prevention or bulletproofing we could do in just in acknowledging that no matter how hard we try, even that we, will have some exposure to these things to, to either lessen our chances of getting Parkinson's or somehow, you know, I want to be active and I, I can't just go test my entire environment and put myself in a bubble. I know that's just not at this point. So I'm trying to look at what are some, some things I can actively do today to start to try to either prepare my body for what is coming at it, no matter how hard I try, or to, you know, somehow just lessen my exposure in more practical day-to-day -day ways. Sure. So one, I wouldn't accept that, that we need to be contaminated by these chemicals. So, you know, you should uh, have, let your representatives know that there's no reason that we need to live in a world where we're using chemicals that other countries like China have banned, that Western Europe has banned. Um, so we need to have an advocacy front. So what can you do really tangibly? Uh, I'll mention a couple other things I didn't mention. Exercise, so vigorous exercise equivalent to three and a half to four hours a week of running or swimming is associated with a 20% decreased risk of develop, ever developing uh, Parkinson's disease. I'm sure you're hearing a lot about the Mediterranean diet uh, at the Real Truth About Health uh, Conference. That's also associated with a decreased risk of Parkinson's disease. So diet high in fruits and vegetables, low in animal products, um, is linked to a decreased risk of Parkinson's disease and is linked to slowing the rate of progression if you have the disease. I think it's also worth considering that some animal products concentrate many of these pesticides. In our book, we just described one case where cows were concentrating a pesticide that was later found in the brains of individuals with uh, Parkinson's disease. I think it's really important that uh, people, if they can't afford to do so, uh, reduce their exposure to pesticides in all forms uh, of it. Um, you know, it's spring in Rochester and, you know, our, our yard has lots of dandelions because uh, we don't use uh, pesticides. Um, we're able to afford uh, uh, organic produce. I wash all my fruits and vegetables, uh, even organic ones uh, with uh, pesticide wash and water. As some of you know that even organic produce have uh, levels of, can have pesticides, detectable levels of pesticides on them. I put a carbon filter on my water if you're one of those Americans who get their water from a, their private well, which is not regulated by the Safe Drinking Water Act, I'd have your water tested. Most of the time when they test uh, wells, they're usually testing it for bacteria. So you gotta make sure that they're testing it for pesticides if you live in rural areas, or they're testing it for these dry cleaning chemicals if you live in urban or suburban areas. Uh, other things that are linked to Parkinson's disease are head trauma. So uh, wear a helmet if you like to bike or ski or do uh, other activities that are uh, high risk. And I, I would actually give uh, some attention if you live in a polluted a, a city that has high levels of air pollution. You know, when you drive through traffic, you can roll up your windows, circulate the air in your car. Uh, for Christmas, my grand and uh, my children bought their grandfather, who lives in Southern California, an air purifier uh, for his home. And you can think about an air purifier if you live in polluted cities. Uh, you know, for your kitchen and your bedroom to decrease your exposure to these tiny pieces of uh, dust and soot in the air called particulate matter. 
So there are lots of things that you can do. We also highlight additional things uh, in these black pages at the back of our book on things that people can do uh, to decrease their risk of developing Parkinson's. Along with decreasing risk, is there a way to, to exposure, is there a way to detoxify once you have been exposed? Yeah, so it's, uh, you know, prevention's uh, uh, worth a lot more than the cure. So there was a study looking at trying to remove uh, iron uh, from the brain. So we know people with Parkinson's disease and other brain diseases have elevated levels of iron. Uh, I'm a little concerned that that might be coming from air pollution because these tiny pieces of dirt and soot carry on, carry with them uh, toxic metals, including iron from brakes and lead from leaded gasoline. There was a study looking at a drug to remove iron from the brain in Parkinson's disease, but that didn't work. In fact, it didn't work so badly, it was toxic uh, to it. Um, it made people's Parkinson's disease worth, worse and caused uh, other side effects. And that was published uh, recently in the New England Journal of Medicine. So really aren't any uh, good evidence of ways of detoxifying this thing, of these chemicals. If you have these diseases, I would really concentrate on getting uh, preventing additional exposure. There is evidence, for example, about air pollution uh, causing or being associated with an increased risk of cognitive impairment in 70-year-old women in Southern California. So even if you're later into life, um, you know, decreasing your exposure to air pollution may decrease your risk of uh, cognitive impairment and dementia, for example. Thank you, doctor. So it's never too late. Our next question is coming from Melanie. Melanie, it's please take a up and ask your question. Uh, Hi Melanie. there. I'm sorry. I was in the middle of something. Um, so I'm curious. I, I actually got here a little bit late, and so maybe I missed this, but what about call, uh, the cause of Parkinson's possibly being COVID? So there, or maybe um, even the vaccinations. I, I didn't have a vaccination, but I did have COVID twice. So and there, that, it, it was after that that I got Parkinson's. So there have been a few uh, cases where viruses uh, uh, can uh, have been linked to Parkinson's disease. The, the most prominent of what was the sleeping sickness in the 1920s, which followed the influenza pandemic in 1918. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of you have seen the movie Awakenings with uh, uh, Robin Williams and Robert De Niro. And this is where uh, this sickness, uh, which caused people to develop really huge amounts of fatigue, and then something called catatonia, where they became almost frozen, uh, mm -hmm. caused to have Parkinsonism. And these people had awakenings when they were given a medication that's highly effective for Parkinson's disease called levodopa. Um, but, and there's some suggestion that other viruses, uh, other viruses have been linked to Parkinsonism. These are likely caused only a small proportion uh, of it. And, um, if you think about Parkinson's disease, these brain diseases, you know, you have to lose 60% of the nerve cells in order for the disease to become manifest, to become visible. So uh -huh. it's really, in my mind, really unlikely that a virus like COVID in a short period of time could cause Parkinsonism. I know that people are looking long-term to see if it does. COVID doesn't enter the brain um, as far as we know. Uh, so I think it's unlikely uh, to do so. And I've seen no studies linking vaccinations uh, to uh, COVID vaccines to Parkinson, Parkinson's or Parkinsonism. So what you're saying is I would have had to be in already the prodromal stages or something for COVID to have maybe pushed me over the edge, perhaps. Yeah, so I think you, so, so there are individuals, uh, Parkinson's and cancers uh, take develop over years. And so many people will say, I got hospitalized for pneumonia and all of a sudden I got uh, Parkinson's disease. So if you think about it, the brain, the body's probably compensating for different diseases. And if you get sick for whatever reason, um, that compensatory mechanism may be lost and you might be in an environment where you're being seen by doctors and other clinicians. And so diseases are more likely to be diagnosed there. But as, as far as it being a causative factor, I think it's very unlikely. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. You're welcome, Melanie. Thank you. So um, you mentioned uh, levodopa, I believe it, it's pronounced. Um, how does dietary protein reduce dopamine by blocking levodopa transport into the brain? Wow. So we got a, a very good question. Thank you, Michael. Um, so uh, levodopa is just an amino acid. And as many of you know, proteins are just made up of amino acids. So and amino acids are, are absorbed in the small intestine, you know, just after our stomach. And so if you take a big meal of protein, you know, a bacon, cheeseburger, bacon cheeseburger, which I know uh, people paying attention, watching the show aren't uh, doing, 
But if you did that and you took your medicine levodopa for Parkinson's disease, you might decrease the amount of levodopa you absorb because you have other proteins being and other amino acids being uh, competing for absorption. So for some people, usually people with more advanced disease, it's good to separate the time you take levodopa for Parkinson's disease from protein meals. For people in the early stages of the disease, um, it's usually not that big of a deal. And sometimes the medicine can cause nausea, so it's better to take it with food. And most people aren't eat, eating bacon and eggs and, and taking um, their medicine for a Parkinson's disease. Hopefully people watching this show know that there are healthier diets to follow. Mm -hmm.